name is Mary Hesdorfer. I'm a nurse practitioner and the executive director of the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation. The informational videos, like the one you are currently watching, has been made possible by the generous support of our donors and our sponsors. They have made the commitment to ensure that the work of this foundation continues in the face of this global pandemic. I am very grateful. Please take a moment to note who they are and if possible to thank them for their commitment to the foundation and the community. Thank you. Hello, my name is Pritesh Shah. I am the Chief Commercial Officer at Novacure. Novacure was founded 20 years ago with the mission to extend survival in the most aggressive forms of cancer with our innovative therapy tumor treating fields. In May 2019, tumor treating fields was approved in combination with chemotherapy to treat people with unresectable, locally advanced, or metastatic malignant pleural mesothelioma, the first FDA approved treatment in over 15 years for mesothelioma. Novacure is proud of our treatment, which may help patients live longer, and a proud sponsor of the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation. Novacure shares MARF's mission to end mesothelioma and the suffering caused by cancer by offering hope, support, education, and innovation. Hi, my name is Joe Bellick, and I'm the founding partner of the Law Offices of Bellick and Fox. We support the mesothelioma community by providing first quality legal representation to mesothelioma patients and their families. During these troubling times, we're proud to support the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation so they can continue the work that they do every day on behalf of mesothelioma patients and their families. We're continuing to do the work that we do and we support the Mesothelioma Research Foundation in continuing to do their work. Hello, I'm Samantha Devine and I'm a physician assistant at UPMC Hillman Cancer Center. Our program offers the most advanced treatment for patients with mesothelioma. We're proud to support the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation because of the great work they do in raising awareness for this disease. Dr. Ford, thank you so much for uh, being willing to uh, join us this morning. Um, could you tell me a little bit about yourself and about your role at Hopkins? Sure. Um, so I'm a thoracic oncologist, a medical oncologist at Johns Hopkins um, with uh, a focus on mesothelioma. Um, I run several clinical trials for patients with mesothelioma here at Johns Hopkins and work closely with colleagues in, in thoracic surgery and radiation oncology in terms of um, providing uh, care for patients with mesothelioma. I'm also um, direct our research program here for thoracic cancers, um, so lung cancer and other malignancies as well. So um, can you tell me a little bit about how, it, how has your role changed in, term, in light of the uh, COVID-19? Are you taken on additional responsibilities, I would imagine, and things are changing rapidly? Yes, yeah, so, um, so for about the last um, six weeks, very intensively, um, the hospital and the university has been preparing for, for for the expectation that there will be a COVID outbreak. And uh, even prior to that, I think our infectious um, diseases specialist, going back to the first reports of the coronavirus back in uh, December and January, they've been working on a preparedness plan. Um, mm -hmm. So I think for a lot of us, in terms of clinicians who are seeing patients day to day, it's really become kind of more evident for us in the last three weeks or so where so along with a lot of the country and the world where, where our lives have changed significantly um, we have adjusted our schedules so for example instead of having there are a total of nine doctors who treat um, thoracic cancers here at Hopkins and instead of having anything up to nine of us in the hospital at any one time we've tried to pare that down and have one doctor in the hospital at any one time um, in order to, so for example, if one of us were to get sick, then there would be a backup of, of other doctors available to fill in over the subsequent weeks uh, while that person was recovering. And this is the medical oncology team that you're speaking about. Exactly, and I think that's, yes. mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. kind of, uh, 
been has been uh, uh, duplicated across the hospital. For example, all of our surgeons, our elective surgery has been cancelled for the last couple of weeks, and um, mm -hmm. the surgeons have weighed in together and they have formed a um, procedure team. Where, for example, if if a patient might need a chest strain to be performed or a central line or any kind of a procedure, they're available 24 hours a day to help the medical team on that regard. So I think those sort of examples are, are evident across the whole system. So uh, for your mesothelioma patients, um, are you, do you also have a pause on your clinical trials? I understand that many of the institutions do at this point. Yes, I think um, so. We, we, we spent a quite some time a couple of weeks ago going through all of our clinical trials and and trying to triage um, w w weighing up the benefit and risk um, to patients of coming into the hospital and mm -hmm. um, uh, the risk of exposure to other people and to potentially to COVID-19. So some of our trials, I would say the majority, probably 90 to 95 percent of our trials are on hold to new accruals mm -hmm. um, uh, patients enrolling. We are continuing on for most patients in terms of treating them on current clinical trials where they're experiencing benefit from the treatment. Um, mm -hmm. And there are trials where there's very specific um, situations where we have formed a committee of all of the researchers in the, in the cancer center where we review specific requests to enroll a patient into a specific trial based on weighing up that risk and benefit for that patient. Okay. And uh, have you also moved into the model now where you're doing uh, telemedicine visits? Yes. So that's, um, yeah, so it's been interesting um, and that's been very fast moving as well because previously it was quite difficult to, in terms of insurances and Medicare, mm -hmm. to do telemedicine. Um, but, but obviously all of those regulations have been, have been liberalized in the last couple of weeks. Um, so I would say about, about 80 percent of our consultations now are te uh, telemedicine and even for patients who are coming in for a treatment where possible we're trying to do a telephone consult instead of seeing them in person right now, so you're with your telemedicine I'm sorry with the telemedicine I'm just curious what program are you using um, so we're using a system called um, calm uh, so polycom it's called um, however mm -hmm. there was also a um, as part of the COVID-19 um, changes in in Medicare regulations and HIPAA, there is, at least for this moment, you are uh, permitted to use um, Skype and FaceTime, um, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. many are more familiar with. Um, right. Now, mm -hmm. HIPAA compliant, but the uh, the Medicare, I think the, re uh, the government regulations have allowed that to be waived for this time period. But where possible, we're using the HIPAA compliant um, platform, uh, which is Polycom. Wonderful. Thank you. That's why I was asking because I thought, you know, so many people are unfamiliar with, uh, you know, with, with any of these platforms and I don't want them to have the fear of not being able to connect uh, and knowing now that you have multiple ways that you are permitted to connect is going to be extremely helpful for this, you know, particularly for this uh, vulnerable population. I think the regular phone is always available, you know, um, mm -hmm. and depending on the that's a, a good option as well if the patient just is not familiar with the um, or doesn't have a smartphone for example or or is not familiar with the uh, the video apps you know and mm -hmm. the video apps can be useful I think, in terms of you can see kind of emotional responses from people both from the mm -hmm. doctor and from the patient but, but if mm -hmm. that's not feasible then I think the phone is an option as well great and then um, you know I remember from my days at Hopkins as well um, your outpatient treatment facility is pretty well self-contained. So I imagine are you, do you, you have two locations that I'm aware of. Are both locations functioning for patients who require chemotherapy? Yeah, yeah. So they've, mm -hmm. um, they've put in a, a pretty major, or the, uh, the hospital administration have put in a, a fairly major um, change to the way the hospital functions. So um, mm -hmm. I think... Um, up to two weeks ago, we had something like 25 different entrances to the hospital. I think we're now down to about five, and those mm -hmm. are um, the main entrances to the cancer building and to the uh, and to the hospital itself, and a couple of other entrances mm -hmm. at various areas of the cancer. And at each of those, there's a a nurse and a security a person checking, um, discussing with the patient whether they have any symptoms which might be concerning for the COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's taking place across. Uh, across many hospitals where we're trying mm -hmm. to 
minimize the exposure of patients and, and doctors. Our chemotherapy and our immunotherapy center is separate, um, so mm -hmm. it's a separate building. You're a building. Um, mm -hmm. It's been it's been remarkably quiet the last couple of weeks, but um, but it, it it it's available and it's not connected to our or not directly beside our inpatient unit, which is good, you know. Right. So how about testing um, at Hopkins? Um, you know, wondering, some of the institutions are testing, um, you know, all comers to the institution. Do you have plans in place to start that? Because, you yeah, know, I, I know that you said, you know, there's so many people that are walking around asymptomatic who are carriers as well that, you know, I'm just wondering if, you know, how we're moving to collect data on those people and, you know, to protect the, the hospital workers and fellow patients. Yeah, I think um, so. At the moment, we've been pretty aggressive in testing, and we have. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, we developed our own in-house test about two weeks ago. The microbiology team, Dr. Carl mm -hmm. and colleagues, and we've been up upscaling that uh, uh, fairly rapidly to the extent that we're now providing it to other um, hospitals. Um, so they're shipping our sa their samples to us for testing and the state as well, I believe. Um, but. In terms of the actual the indications for testing, I think um, we tend to still follow the CDC guidance where possible. Now, obviously, if mm -hmm. there's a clinical system outside of those specific guidances, then we will pursue that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And our timeline is pretty good in terms of response, uh, our results being available um, for patients where there's an urgent need to get a result, or for a healthcare worker, for example, who's exposed, generally, mm -hmm. that, and that response back the same day. Um, and for patients who are at home and who are uh, relatively stable, however, um, there's a concern for COVID. Generally, it takes between one and two days for that result to come back. So it's pretty quick. Um, and, right. uh, and, I think at, and I think at this point, we're not urging um, everyone to run to get tested, particularly if they're patients, because even coming to get tested at some of these testing sites has an inherent risk associated with it as well. Exactly. I think that mm -hmm. the, the types of we're looking for are the kind of classical, the fever, um, mm -hmm. the fever of 38 degrees Celsius um, or 100 degrees Fahrenheit or the um, new, new onset cough, new onset shortness of breath um, mm -hmm. or other kind of chest symptoms, you know, and, and the difficulty for patients with mesothelioma is that many of them have those, uh, some of those symptoms already. So it's really a change over that baseline which we're looking out for, or obviously if there's someone in the household who has mm -hmm. been diagnosed with it or has developed a febrile illness, it's important to let mm -hmm. your doctor know as well, you know. Right. So I, I do have a question very specific to you because I know that, you know, you have really been, you know, very much involved in immunotherapy over the years. Hopkins, uh, I, I think, actually was one of the first sites testing some of those uh, immunotherapy agents. Um, I know that some of the side effects associated with Keytruda and Nivolumab and some of the other, um, you know, um, PDL1 inhibitors um, can create symptoms that are very similar to COVID-19. Um, so I wonder, in patients with mesothelioma, um, you know, we don't really have uh, an, we don't have an approval with immunotherapies. Um, how do you, you know, what are your thoughts on starting uh, patients on immunotherapies during this period of time uh, if they've failed frontline therapy? Yeah, I think it's, it's a very good question and, and one that we, we, we've been looking at very closely in the context of, um, of, uh, of lung cancer where many patients are receiving immunotherapy mm -hmm. as their first treatment. Um, mm -hmm. And one of my Dr. Nadu, um, in collaboration with others here, we've developed this um, an algorithm for how we will, one of the potential side effects of immunotherapy is lung inflammation. Now it's pretty rare, mm -hmm. it's less than, uh, less than 5% of patients. But we've developed an algorithm for patients who, uh, say for example, might come in with shortness of breath while on immunotherapy or mm -hmm. a new cough, all of the symptoms of either COVID-19 or, or lung inflammation, pneumonitis due to immunotherapy. And we've uh, put that algorithm in place for testing and how we might deal with such cases. Uh, thankfully, we have not had any patients so far. In terms of patients who are considering starting immunotherapy, I think if there's a good indication for the treatment uh, and the benefit outweighs any, any risks, I think it's still a good, it's a good option and it's within the NCCN guidelines, although not FDA approved for mm -hmm. patients 
prior um, chemotherapy for mesothelioma. Mm -hmm. And we do have, we also have some mesothelioma patients who are continuing on immunotherapy clinical trials here at Hopkins at the moment. Wonderful. So, um, Dr. Ford, I, I want, really want to thank you for your time. And I also, um, I, you know, I know that uh, Hopkins is a wonderful resource, uh, you know, actually globally as well as, you know, um, you know, nationally for COVID-19. You put out some very good information, reliable information. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just would like to make sure that uh, patients are aware of where to find it. And I guess uh, they would just go on to the Johns Hopkins site. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Yeah, so there's um, so so a lot of people may have seen the um, the Johns Hopkins tracker we uh, a website where they're tracking cases around the world, um, and there is also a resource website linked to that. So it has a lot of kind of uh, uh, truthful information about coronavirus. Um, so I'd encourage people to look into that. If you put in, for example, um, COVID nineteen or coronavirus and Johns Hopkins. Uh, and provided it's got hopkinsmedicine.org as the source website, then it'll be it'll be good information, you know. Wonderful, yeah, because there's so much flying around the web right now, and you know it leads to this state of confusion as to you know uh, you know what, what you know quote unquote fake news versus real news. So um, you know I, I like the idea of looking for you know hopkinsmedicine.org because at least we know then we've got the right source. And I encourage everyone who's listening to this call to check your sources, be very careful with what you share on the, uh, on, the, on the web because, you know, we're talking about people's lives right now and accurate information and timely information is so important. Um, so Dr. Ford, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. And um, I hope that we will continue to be in touch. So if any situations change, you'll let us know um, as we help to guide patients, you know, around the country. Um, you know, with their various options and, you know, what's happening at the, you know, the institutions. So thank you again exactly. for the timely interview. And uh, I hope you remain safe and your family remains healthy as well. Same to you, Mary. Take care now. Thank you.